what your situation is right now, uh, especially in Bishkek, but uh, I, I decided I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to record this video and um, about some things that uh, we've done in the past or people have, that have had questions about certain things. So let me go ahead. Let me record the video and post it. Uh, and that um, we'll see. We'll see how this goes. OK, I thought maybe before. Uh, going on with uh, some of the exact course related content, I just show you something and that is. Uh, uh, let me. Let me share my screen. OK, what I have right here is a spreadsheet that I wrote up a few years ago. I was trying to uh, figure out an algorithm uh, that I had seen. A student had asked me a question about how something worked. And uh, based on answering that question, I got involved with the following problem. Uh, you're all familiar with the number pi. And pi is the ratio between the circumference of a circle and the diameter of a circle. And it also appears in many, many, many other things that have nothing to do with circles, which is sort of interesting um, how and why that happens and how this ratio of a circle to a circumference can be so widespread across areas of mathematics and science. And the, the, the problem that I was trying to solve right here was um, how to compute as many digits of pi as I wanted. And as you may know, pi is an irrational number. And as an irrational number, it its digits in the fraction for pi, the digits go on forever. And that uh, the, the decimal expansion for pi never ends. And um, that's a character and, and, and also it doesn't repeat. It's not like the digits of the fraction go decimal point one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three on forever. And as you may remember from doing math um, back in the day, is that if the digits of a fraction terminate or if they get into this repetition, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and so on forever, then the number must be a rational number. If neither one of those things happens, in other words, if the digits never terminate and they never go into a, a, a periodic repetition, that uh, the number must be irrational and pi is irrational. In other words, you cannot represent the number pi uh, as an integer divided by an integer. Although there's, there are some approximations uh, that do exactly that, such as 22 divided by 7 is a way that people approximate pi as a rational number. But pi is not rational. The digits go on forever and they don't repeat. And because of that, um, it's been, uh, if you like, is a, a contest uh, among nerds over I would say not only over centuries, but perhaps over millennia to uh, compute pi in the most accurate way. Get as many digits of pi as you possibly can. And up until relatively recently, maybe about uh, 30 years ago, uh, you could only, your ability to compute the digits of pi were based on how large the word size was in the computer that you were using. The computer had a 32 bit word. You could compute by pi to maybe close to 32 digits. 
if the computer had a 64-bit word, you could compute pi to more digits than that. And um, But you were always limited. You're, there were always a finite number of digits that you could compute pi to based on how good your computer was. Then um, one fellow um, or two people uh, who are authors on the paper, uh, Rabinowitz and Wagon were their names, mathematicians who figured out basically no matter how good the computer was, you could compute pi to as many digits as you wanted to compute it. So, and they developed a technique called the spigot algorithm. Now, I'm not going to describe the spigot algorithm, but I will say that um, when I found their paper, uh, Rabinowitz and Wagon, I found their paper on the spigot algorithm online uh, and read it, that it was, uh, although it wasn't highly advanced mathematics, uh, the way that they were doing this computation in this algorithm was not a way that I was familiar with. And um, they uh, were, were doing their divisions in the remainder form. Okay, usually in math, when we divide two numbers, we just represent it as a, a decimal that goes out so far, or possibly as a, a, a mixed number, which is an integer in a fraction. Well, in any case, these people were doing something different, Rabinowitz and Wagon. And they had a small chart inside their paper, which illustrated what they were doing. But I remember really being con confused at the time as to exactly what they were doing, why they were doing it that way. And so it took me actually several weeks going over the paper again and again and again and again, trying to figure out exactly what they were doing and how this spigot algorithm worked. And it actually took me probably close to six weeks overall to understand that algorithm. And, um, uh, and which I'm not proud of, but <laughs> It, it took me that long. And um, and when I was first trying to figure how this algorithm worked, I decided first before writing a more complete computer program to do it, uh, which was which I when I did it was done in the computer language Java, which you may have heard of. And uh, by the way, um, you sometimes hear of JavaScript. Well, Java and JavaScript are actually two different computer languages, which you may not be aware of. But uh, the, I wrote my program eventually in Java. But before doing that, I actually implemented the Spigot algorithm in Excel. And uh, this is the Excel spreadsheet I used, and I'm not expecting you to read all these numbers, but give you an idea here how big it was. And uh, let me let me uh, maybe expand this out. View, I'll go up to 200. So here it is, right here. Now notice one thing that all these computations the answers are integers. So we can see what formula is in each cell, click on it, and here's the formula in that cell. Uh, here's the formula in that cell. And here's the formula in that cell right there. So you can see what the formulas are in each cell. And um, I was, in particular, I was computing the values of pi in base two or binary numbers, and um, rather than in decimals. And uh, I had a reason for that, um, but it had to do with uh, a larger problem I, that I decided uh, to try to work on um, based on the 
properties of the digits of pi. But these are the answers over here. So uh, this is the integer part of pi, which is the binary number one one. That means one unit, and then in the second place is one two. So this is one two plus one one. Two plus one is three. And if you remember, the first digit in pi in in base ten is three, right? Pi is 3.14159 and so on. So the first digit is three. So here's a three. And then uh, what I, uh, and I continue, and I computed multiple digits at a time. I think in this representation here, I computed eight digits at a time. So one, one is the decimal three. And then you consider at this point, there'd be your your decimal point. In base two, it's called a binary point. So this, would, this is three point, and then these are the first several base two digits of pi. And then these are the digits that come after that. These are the digits that come after that, and so on. So that's what this does. I actually implemented the spigot algorithm in pi, and I did that because in the spreadsheet, uh, you can see what's happening at every step. And this is what I, what I was trying to do in order to understand how the algorithm worked. I was trying to see at every stage of the algorithm exactly what was being produced and how it was being produced as a way of understanding how the algorithm worked. So this is probably one of the most complicated spreadsheets I've ever written. And I just thought I would show that to you. I then went on to, uh, as I said, to, to write a program in the computer language Java. And in that program, I actually computed a million and a half binary digits of pi. And, uh, and but I, I, I won't continue with that discussion there. Uh, but I just thought I would show that to you. Now, let me go back to the magic square question. As I looked at this in a little bit more detail, and uh, so, and I've got two versions of the uh, the magic square solution right here. And you know, let me get this out of the way here. There we go. Okay, and this first one, um, let me pull up the solver. We look in data and solver. So notice in this version of the magic square, knowing that the four by four magic square, we want to make the rows and co uh, columns sum up to 34. Um, so I put the constraint that these numbers have to equal 34. The sum of these numbers have to equal 34. Similarly, the sum of these numbers has to be 34. And then these are the two diagonal sums. So I set all of these things equal to 34. And I also added the condition that they all be different. Now, um, something that uh, I did over the last few days when I was redoing this, trying to get it to work right, uh, what I decided to do was look at specific entries into the magic square. So here the entry here is in the first um, element right here. I decided what I would do is view that as the uh, objective of the computation. And I would look at different examples. I would try to set that equal to a max or a min or whatever. Now, in the four by four magic square to get a solution, we want all of these integers to be different. And at the same time, you know, four by four has 16 entries. So we're going to compute 16 different digits. Uh, and it has to satisfy the constraints on the sums. Now, suppose I look at this first cell as being the objective and I say, I want a max, I want the max number that can go in there. Well, because there are 16 integers in this particular magic square, 
the max number here is 16. If I wanted to do min, the min number would be one. So here is the constraints. Now I'm setting the constraints. I don't think it might, you might have a hard time seeing this. Uh, I have this first constraint where I select all of the cells in the magic square and I say they all have to be different numbers. And then B6 to E6, B6 to E6 are um, B6 to E6. B6 is this number, C6, D6, E6. So um, I'm saying all of these terms have to equal 64. And these numbers, here, let me, let me just delete that for a moment. All these numbers right down here are, in fact, these are just these sums. So the formula here is the sum of these numbers, just like the formula in this cell represents the sum of these numbers. So let's set the objective of B2, which is that cell, and say we want to find the solution to the magic square problem that maximizes that entry. So. If I hit solve. So now it's solving. And OK, so notice that it picks the value in that cell to be 16. Now let me try. Instead of setting it equal to max, let me set it equal to min right there. Now. Hopefully, since these numbers in these cells go from 1 to 16, we will get a 1 here. So we will get a different set of numbers in the solution to the magic square. Let's see what happens. Notice I'm doing the simplex algorithm here for my optimization technique. So it's solving now. And indeed, I get a 1 here. And the 16 is way over here now. Let's just try one more thing with that. And um, let's go hit solver. Let's pick a different cell in here. Let's pick this one. I don't know if there's a solution here or not, but let me delete this here. Let me pick this cell right here. Let me set that equal to max. So is there a solution to the magic square problem where that cell is equal to 16? I'll solve it. And indeed there appears to be, here's 16, and they, they all, the rows and columns all add up to 34 as prescribed. So this allows us to get you know, different sets of numbers uh, from 1 to 16 in all of the cells, which uh, solves the magic square problem. OK, now, as I said, as I, as I was doing this, the question that occurred to me as I, when I was setting up the magic square problem is that could I still solve it if I didn't know the answer was 34. And that's sheet two here. OK, now. Let's look at my. OK, now. So I have the objective B2 just as I did at the beginning of the last set. Now I've set the constraints the numbers have to be all different. Here I set them to be integer two. And now I have set that I'm setting these, uh, say the cells B6 to E6, B6 to E6, all these numbers here, which are the sums in these columns, these numbers here all have to equal what this number is, which is the sum of the numbers in that row. 
And I'm not specifying that that sum has to be 34. I'm just saying that these have to equal that. Okay, similarly, I say this has to equal that, this has to equal that, and this has to equal that, and this has to equal that, and this is, it has to equal that. So this is what these constraints are. Let's look at this one. This says that B8 to B9 has to equal F2. Uh, B8 and B9 are these two. I'm saying these, these two values have to equal this value. So, so I didn't specify that the numbers have to be 34. I only specified that they all have to be equal. And I wanted to see if there was a solution to the magic square problem that wasn't equal to 34. And um, so I didn't specify the sum to be 34. I only specified the constraints about the rows and columns and diagonals all have to sum up to the same number. And when I do that and I run the problem, It's, it's running now. And, and I indeed get, they have to sum up the 34. And here it says, I set it equal to a maximum, 16. So let's just try setting this equal to a minimum. So I go back to solver and I'll set B2 equal to a minimum. Now let me solve it using simplex. See if I get one there. And indeed, I get a solution with one there, and they're all different, and, uh, and it's still equal to 34. So, um, at this point, let me uh, see, does anyone have any questions about this um, magic square problem and what I'm trying to do and uh, how I set this problem up in Solver? I'll wait for a few seconds here to see if anyone has any questions. Okay, I'm not hearing anything. Of course, uh, maybe there are people that have questions, but they but they signed in and then they are off doing something else and not listening to the lecture with the idea of, of looking at the recording later, but uh, nothing I can do about that. And let me add another sheet here because I know that some people had questions about the nested if statements. So I thought I would just mention that here. And there's a faculty meeting going on now too. So uh, when I'm kind of finished talking about things, I, I may end class early to go over to that faculty meeting. Okay, let me add another sheet. And let me set up view 200 here. Okay. And uh, the nested if statements. So let me go into a little bit how they work. Let me, uh, uh, let's say my goal is to uh, simulate uh, the role of a die. And um, let's say it's a simple six-sided die. It has on it the numbers one through six. So I want to use Excel to simulate the role of a die. So I'm going to do that by putting the formula in column A, I'm going to say equals um, six times six times Rand there. Okay, so what this does, if I just use Rand and didn't multiply by six, let me come back up here just use rand, I would generate a random number uniformly distributed between zero and one. So the 
It can be uh, it can be any fraction equally likely between zero and one. I multiply by six, and I have a random number uniformly distributed between zero and six. So that's what I'm getting here. Now, what I want to do is to um, convert whatever this number is right here into integers of uh, one through six. And I'm going to do that with nested if statements. And uh, first, let me, I'll generate either a one or a two. And I'll do that with it, and I'm going to do right in this column. I'm going to put in my, my formula for the nested if statements. I put equal and then if. And now I'll look at whatever this number is. So if, and I'll click on this, and I'll say, if this is greater than one, I'll put a comma. I think a comma is what I'm supposed to put in there. If it's greater than one, I'll generate the number. Well, let me do it like this. If it's, let me say less than one, not greater than one. Less than one. If it's less than one, I'll generate the number one. And if it's greater than one, I'll generate the number two. So I'm just putting this if statement in there. I need a second parenthesis there. So if A1 is less than one, I generate a one. Otherwise, I generate a number two. I hit return. And this number is in fact less than one, so I generate a one. And but because this can be any number between zero, I said zero and six. Um, when I, I multiply by six up here, this number could be any any number between zero and six. So it's much more likely to have a number between one and six than zero and one. So I should generate two five times every for every time I generate a one. So I can click and shift click. I can drag this down a bit. Let me drag it down 10. So you look here, there are many more twos than one because I'm much more likely to get a number that's between one and six than I am to get a number between zero and one. So this if statement right here is if A1, and again, this number, this value isn't expanded. So it's hard, gonna be more difficult to read. But this is generating one and two, with a two being much more likely. So if A1 is less than one, I generate a one. Otherwise, if it's greater than one, I generate a two. Now, what, the way the nested if statement works, instead of generating the two here, I'm gonna put in another if statement. So right in here, I can put if. So now, the number is going to be between one and six and not zero and one. Because if the number was between zero and one, the if statement sends the control to the to the one. So it prints out a one. If the number is greater than one, it'll send the control to the second statement after this second comma. Now, before I had two in there, so it all, it'll print out a two, but instead of printing out a two, I want to execute another if statement. So I put if, now the number is going to be greater than one. So if the number is less than 
two instead of less than one. OK, so. If. A one. Is less than two. And I'll put a comma. If it's less than two. I'll produce a two. And otherwise, let's say I produce a three. And then parentheses. So instead of where I had the number two just a few moments ago, I'm now putting in another if statement. So let's go through the logic here. First, if is the number less than one, yes or no? If it's not less than one, I transfer control over to here and I check. Is it less than two? Yes or no? Now I hit return. Here the number is between three and four, so it's not less than two, and I produce three. Now let me click, shift click, and pull this down. So now my numbers can be one, two, and three. And and I'm here I'm generating only one one. And if you look here, everything else is greater than two, so I'm generating a three. OK, now. So I have this F to check if it's less than one, I produce a one. This generates checks to see if it's less than two. I generate uh, a two. Now, otherwise it generates a three. I can replace this by another if statement. The three get I get another if statement if a two is less than three. If a two is less than three, I'll generate a three. Otherwise, I'll generate a four. OK, so this is less than one, so it generates a one. And now let me drag this down. Shift. There. So now I, I can generate the numbers one, two, three or four with this. So this is how the nested if statements work. Now I can continue on. I want to check for a five and check for a six. Notice that Four is the most likely number because I'm more likely to get a number uh, which is greater than three. And when it's greater than three, it generates a four. So I can replace the four by another if statement. And um, that actually, uh, and, and, and uh, I might think I might need another one after that. So. In this way, I can simulate the role of the die going from uh, a, a, the value one up through the value six. So this is the idea behind the nested if statements. Let me try to copy this and then I'll put it on a file so you can file new. Let me zoom way out. There we are. I hope you can see it now. So this, how these nested if statements work. If A1 is less than one, if it is, I produce a one. If it's not less than one, I execute another if statement. If A2 is less than two, we already know now that it's not less than one because we would have generated a one. So now we know it's not less than one. So it's got to be greater than one. Now we check, it's, we know it's greater than one, but is it less than two? So if it's greater than one and less than two, we generate a two. If not, we we jump to another if statement. So, yeah. Is there a question? Okay, no. Okay. I'm off right there. OK, I think somebody just had their their microphone on. 
So this is how these nested if statements work. And um, okay, so that's nested if statements. Um, the uh, I went back over the uh, the magic square again, and um, I think the mistake I was making last time, and somebody actually mentioned it in class. They were suggesting that I should uh, put a uh, uh, set of value of a cell equal to a maximum or minimum, and I wasn't doing that. I was kind of ignoring that. Um, that entry into the solver um, box. And by doing that, depending on what was selected or not selected in that box, it was either working properly or not working properly. And um, now one of the things that's interesting here on this is that um, we can solve the magic square problem without knowing that the sum had to be 34. To me, the interesting question is, what are the minimum number of constraints that we need to set in order for us to get a solution? In other words, what I did was, I didn't know what the value in this cell was, and all I did was say that every other sum had to be the same as the value in this cell. And by doing that, I, I got 34, which is telling me that 34 is very likely the only solution to the problem. And still an open question right now in my mind is do we have to specify that all these sums, these and these and these, have to equal that? Or is it enough, for example, just to specify that these three sums have to equal that. I don't think it's enough. Uh, and if we only specify these three sums, will that automatically set these three sums equal to the same value? And, um, or maybe I have to specify these three sums equal to the first sum and these three sums equal to that sum and none of the others. If I do that, do I still get the 34 as an answer or do I do I get something that isn't quite right? So I don't think we need to specify all of the sums. And I observed on the three by three problem that we could, uh, that we didn't need to specify all of these sums. Every single one of them was equal to this one. I could leave some of these constraints out and I still got the answer to be 34. And, uh, but I haven't done that exercise on the four by four magic square. And I don't know on the five by five magic square if there is one and what the answer is. I haven't worked that out either. So, um, so okay, let me, let me go back now. Let me go out of my screen share. And I see you all there. And I'll see if there are any questions here. Yeah. Remember, next week, I uh, want you to have gone through and done this. Uh, I'll call it a project on looking at the COVID data, either the COVID data that I presented to you or other COVID data. And uh, I think at least one people, one person is doing something interesting, looking at the value of uh, stocks in relation to COVID. In other words, after COVID hit, what happened to some uh, stock values? Uh, and I actually think they were looking at Zoom. So yeah, that's pretty interesting. And um, so with that, uh, what next week when I do class, I may go in and ask some of you to uh, explain what you have done on that. And I'm not looking for a great extended project. I'm, I'm just looking to see if you understand Excel sufficiently well 
that you can do a problem that I haven't talked about. Uh, you can do something that doesn't involve uh, finding averages or using if statements or simulating random numbers. Just do something different than what I've talked about. See if you understand Excel well enough to solve a problem of your own choosing. That's all that I'm looking for. So I may uh, ask some of you, if you're willing, I'm not going to make anybody do it if they're if they're shy about doing it. But I, I may ask some of you to sort of share your screen and talk a little bit about what you have done uh, with that problem. And uh, and then after that, uh, I think we have another week or so, which I will discuss things. Then there's the uh, the midterm break. And as I told you before, I'm not planning on giving you a midterm. I, I look at the the project as being equivalent to a midterm. And Excel, like anything else, you know, some of you, if you never use Excel, at some point down the road, if you decide you want to use it, you may have forgotten much of what we've talked about, and you'll have to go back and refresh yourself because we remember what we use. I mean, you can sit and memorize things and uh, you memorize it. And you might know it for tomorrow and the next day or for the next week. But when you try to memorize things and you never use it, you very quickly forget it, which is why I'm not a big fan of sitting down and memorizing stuff because I really don't think it works unless you happen to be uh, one of that very small group of people who remember absolutely everything that they look at. A term for that is called an eidetic memory, where you never forget anything. You remember everything that happens to you every day. I'm not sure that would be a good thing. I guess it would be good if you were studying to be a doctor or something, but you know, we all have things probably that we don't want to remember that we would remember. OK, so with that, I think I'm going to try to go in and uh, join that faculty meeting that's going on now. So I'll end the class a little bit early. But before I do that, I want to check. Are there any questions that anybody has or concerns about something or problems you're having with? Maybe I can notify IT people about something. So um, before I before I disappear here, uh, we have any questions, people? And um, I'll just say here, based on uh, uh, you know, what everybody has done before, is uh, you know people who have been turning in their assignments every week. And I have some people who said they wanted to take the course but haven't done anything. I worry about those people. But for those of you who have been regularly turning in assignments, everybody is doing exceptionally well. And, um, and as I told you before, if you have any doubts as to what your grades are, email me and I'll, and I'll tell you, you know, what you're doing now. Uh, and but everyone, everyone is doing very well and there's no reason to be concerned about your grade. Um, I, th I think it's quite possible that everyone is getting an A right now. So, OK, so with that, um, be safe. Uh, don't get arrested. Uh, I, you know, in case anyone's interested, I've been arrested in my life, you know, back in my youth when I was unwise. OK, so, you know, uh, I'll set myself up as an example of what not to do. And um, so with that, uh, I'll see you guys all next week. Take care, OK? Thank you, you too. Thank yep. you. Sure, bye-bye. Thank you, you too. Bye.